In the last lecture, in lecture two of this course, we looked at general equilibrium as both a, an important concept through which to view markets, but also as an analysis tool to study government interventions. And we have said, we have seen in the end of uh, lecture two that it is not always easy to get redistribution or to have redistribution without welfare losses. So we are very often in this second best world where we have to decide as a society or where a government has to decide, to decide between having a, a very an efficient outcome, which means the largest possible pie that gets produced and consumed in the economy and the most equitably distributed pie. So there is this equity efficiency trade-off. It can be bigger in some places than in others, but in most places it's there. Now, that's one insight. That's one reason why uh, th there can be welfare losses due to redistribution. Another reason why we may deviate from the efficient outcome are so-called market failures. And this is what lecture three and lecture four are mainly all about. And we will revisit this as well in lecture number six, which will be on taxation. Now, let's briefly talk before we talk about what exactly market failures are. I want to point one, out one thing here about the semantics of failures. So it sounds as if a market failure was per se something bad. And I admit that it's not probably the, the, the best expression one could find. I would rather, and even if you call it a market imperfection, it implies that it's something that is less good than a perfect market. In lecture three, I will try and convince you that this is not necessarily a good way of describing things because there are some some institutions or there are some situations where the free market as we've encountered it in the first lecture sorry in the second lecture um, that the free market does not work does not work the way we we think it should work but yet this is actually we are actually in a situation where th that that we're all quite comfortable with so let's talk briefly about some of the potential market failures so th there are some um so so here are three types of market failures uh, two of which we will talk about in this course so the first one is imperfect competition and imperfect competition you will mainly talk about in intermediate micro and if you're really interested in the subject then in uh, industrial organization. So what we mean by imperfect competition is uh, for example monopolies or oligopolies whereby a couple of firms basically dominate a given market. So here are some examples for example we have a, a postal service that has pretty much a monopoly um, on uh, at least the, the postage of letters. And it used to be back in the day that uh, there was also the, the post in most countries had a monopoly on, on uh, sending parcels or delivering parcels. Um, or here the, the other example is uh, trains that most countries have only one train company or maybe only a very small number. And while this is not necessarily a bad thing, there is something to be said about having a, a publicly owned and operated train company or having a publicly in, uh, owned and operated postal service. Um, these companies that have monopolies or quasi monopolies can dictate prices or at least they have some influence on the prices. So they have price setting power. If companies have price setting power, that means that 
there are implications for for welfare. So if we leave a market with a monopolist or a, an oligopoly where a couple of firms share the market, if we leave that to its own devices, we will actually achieve an outcome that is suboptimal. So if we regulate that market, we that can actually be welfare improving. So, so this is one reason market imperfections, uh, imperfect competition is a reason why the first welfare theorem for sure breaks down and we would also have a, a problem with redistribution if, if that's what markets look like. The other two are externalities and public goods. So externalities we will talk about in lecture four. You see here some external, some productions or goods that come with externalities. Let me give you an example. So you see here a factory that produces and at the same time as a byproduct of that production, it pollutes the air. Now that air pollution has effects on all sorts of market participants, right? The air quality is worse. It may cause some health effects. Um, and there is all sorts of negative effects attached to pollution. Now, if we leave that market to its own devices, what's going to happen is that no one's going to, that the firm is not going to pay everyone else for the damage it causes by polluting the air. And it will probably produce however much it wants and finds optimal, but does not factor in that the entire economy or that a part of the economy suffers due to the production of that fur. Right? And when you follow the discussion about climate change, for example, there is a lot of you know, a lot of the questions in climate that, that have to do with, with climate change and with pollution evolve around externalities. Here are two other examples. One that is very timely, that is vaccinations, which is actually some uh, what one would call a positive externality, because if I get vaccinated against an infectious disease, um, then I cannot spread that disease to others, or at least the likelihood that I spread it to others is much lower than without the vaccination. So with the vaccination, not only do I protect myself, but I also protect others with it. The same can actually be said about the use of face masks. So there's a one thing why face masks are so effective or are so important besides that they're very cheap is that they actually, uh, when a lot of people wear them, protect, so people protect one another with it. So it's not so much that the wearing the face mask benefits myself, but it has a huge externality on all the other people who interact with me. Third example here for an externality um, is, is banks. And, and here in Ireland, um, I mean, most of the participants of this course were very young at the time when, uh, when the financial crisis uh, hit Ireland. Um, but there was definitely a, a good few banks in, in Ireland that um, had you know, loans on their books that were very, very you know, where, where their balance sheets were, were completely overblown and where they were severely exposed to, to risks in, in real estate markets. And so uh, we, we experienced then those, those massive bailouts. Um, now, where is the externality here? The externality is that if one bank, uh, for example, fails and collapses, that may have huge implications in people's trust in the entire system. And so that may cause then a domino effect in the entire banking system. And that therefore, whatever happens in one bank, the risk taking of one bank may also affect then other banks um, and, and, and whatever happens in, in them. So, so that can also be seen as an externality. Again, externalities will be uh, covered in depth in lecture four. And the third category of market failure, and one that we will talk about in lecture three, is public goods. 
And public goods are one of the reasons why I think it's not necessarily a good thing to talk about market failures, because public goods in many cases are actually something desirable. Right? So these are goods, we will learn the exact definitions, that can but don't have to be provided by the, the government, but they are characterized by, by two um, features. Uh, one is so-called non-excludability, which is that you cannot easily exclude anyone from the enjoyment of that good. And the other is non-rivalry, which is that if I consume the good, that does not affect how much of the good you can, you can enjoy or anyone else. And so here are some examples of, uh, of public goods. So a lighthouse is a, is a very clear example. Um, you know, we, we would all agree that for, for, um, for ships, lighthouses are crucial. Um, there would be so, otherwise there would be lots of accidents, especially around this island, if there weren't any lighthouses. Um, and so, you know, it, it's not that I can say I can charge one ship uh, for for using the lighthouse and, and not another. Um, you know, the, the lighthouses are simply there at the coast and they, they shine for all the ships out there. Um, and it's not possible to exclude a particular ship. At the same time, um, the, 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 the signal that comes from these, from these lighthouses, because one ship gets it, doesn't mean that another ship gets less of that signal. Another example here for a public good are, are parks, to the extent that, that uh, parks are you know, large enough to, to, you know, for, for a lot of people to enjoy them. Um, in most public parks, people do not get excluded or cannot get excluded. There is not someone at the entrance uh, checking whether you come in or not. So therefore the enjoyment of everyone and to the extent that they're as big as Phoenix Park, for example, um, they're also, you know, if, if even if lots of people use them, there is still space for others. And so the enjoyment of some people doesn't reduce the enjoyment of the park for other people. A third example here is the army or is more safety in a country or public defense, right? Um, it's not that the Irish army, even though I'm not an Irish citizen, but the Irish army defends both those of you who are Irish citizens and those, those of you who, who are not, but who are residents here. So it's not possible to exclude someone from the good of safety. Um, at the same time, uh, safety is non, as we call it, non-rivalrous because um, it's uh, it's you know it's it's not possible that like I get safety and because I'm you know the the army defends my interest as a resident here the army can defend less of your interest the army defends all our interests okay so you see here there are public goods that are very important and that are very useful thing to have, yet they follow their own economic logic and oftentimes they lead, or actually in most cases, the free markets that we have encountered in lecture two do not work when there are public goods. And one reason why they don't work is because those public goods need to be financed somehow, but because they're non-excludable, people often have an incentive not to contribute, right? If, if we have to all make a conscious decision, each of us to contribute to the army, um, if I know that the army is gonna be there anyway, I have no incentive to contribute to it uh, um, because the army will still be there. But if everyone makes that decision, then there aren't enough funds. And so governments need to have some enforcement mechanism to solve this so-called free rider problem. And so a lot of the lecture three will be exactly about the free rider problem. Okay? 
So we will talk about the difference, not only in terms of pictures, but also in terms of economic theory, between public goods, the examples that I've given here, and private goods. So here you have some examples for private goods, where one of at least one of the two uh, conditions of or the, the two defining conditions for public goods are not met right in e with each of these goods if if i purchase it i can exclude others from using these goods right i may get something positive out of enjoying a pint with friends but that is, but yet it's my decision whether I can ex whether I exclude them or not, or who I have that pint of Guinness with, or you know, in that case, lager or or or, or not. And right? the same goes with, you know, who drives my car or who drives with me in the car or who I have food with, uh, who comes to my house and so on. Right? Um, at the same same time, if I drink that one pint of lager, someone else cannot drink it. So, so they are also to some extent rivalrous in consumption. Mm -hmm. And so we will learn in this lecture the difference between public goods, which is new, at least in, in, f to most of you in terms of economic, the underlying economic theory, versus private goods, which most of you have encountered a lot uh, when it in, in in intermediate micro and basically most of our theory about markets is based on private goods. So public goods will be an innovation and I hope I can convince you a very important one. <laughs>